Welcome to day two of Positionality, a symposium on Latinx and Latin American arts in Canada. Today we are joined by Nuria Cardona Garmont, who will be chairing today's session on questioning notions of mestizaje. I would like to start this session off by acknowledging that the land on which Sir Gallery is placed on is the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. Today, the meeting place of Tikaranto is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're very grateful to have the opportunity as immigrants and settlers to this land to work and present here. We also realize that today we're all coming from different regions throughout Canada, perhaps even Latin America or elsewhere. And this land acknowledgement only covers a small portion of unceded territories. I encourage you all to learn more about the land on which you are situated, the traditional ways of knowing and being prior to colonial impositions and genocidal practices. As a starting point, I recommend visiting native-land.ca. I'm adding that in the chat right now. Um, and I will now pass it over to Nuria to start us off. Thank you, Ana. Uh, gracias, Hannah, por esta introducción. So thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, it is a really great pressure uh, to participate in this symposium. And I take this opportunity also to thank the great effort of the Sur Gallery team, and especially to you, Hannah and Tamara Toledo, to carry out this event uh, that I want to say it seems crucial to me uh, at a time where we are collectively redefining the historical and social place of the diasporas and also the cultural singularities in Canada. And also, I think, uh, a key moment to think what we mean when we talk about uh, Latino Canadian art and consequently uh, to question the commonplace of historical concepts such as mestizaje. So uh, before giving the floor to the participants, I would like to welcome all of you to this panel, Critical Subjectivities Questioning Mestizaje. And uh, to talk about this subject, I will be sharing the forum with four artists, Miguel Cinta Solis, uh, Rodrigo Alcantara, Esteban Perez, and Carlos Colin, to whom I also welcome and thank very much uh, for the enthusiasm in participating in, in this dialogue. So I would like to remind you uh, that uh, the topic discussed here are defined by the positionality of the person who enunciates them, and that this conversation is a space of openness, of respect and collaboration, where fruitful, honest discussion can be shared and valued. Uh, at the end of the presentations, we will have a few minutes uh, for comments and questions from the audience that you can share with us uh, using the, the Zoom chat. And uh, as uh, Hannah said, uh, uh, I'm so grateful that we have uh, this simultaneous translation in Spanish and Portuguese uh, of the panel, so uh, you can click on the bottom below. So. Um, Sin más tardar, I would like to start by introducing our first uh, panelist, uh, Miguel Cinta Solis, who is a mestizo uh, XXX interdisciplinary artist and writer uh, working in performance, video, new media, textile, and installation. His work considers questions of uh, perversity and territory, on belonging, decolonial imaginaries, and Chicano futures. He is currently working on a PhD in cultural, social, and political thought at the University of uh, Lethbridge in the Treaty 7 territory, uh, where he received his MFA in art. So, Miguel Cinta, te doy la palabra. Gracias, Nuria. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would really like to thank Nuria and, and Sud Gallery for uh, this wonderful invitation. It's really, really exciting. Um, I, you know, as I'll mention in my presentation a bit, I have been feeling a little bit of disconnect from Latinx, Latina community, and so this has been a really, really, really wonderful, um, uh, like flagging, flagging me down <laughs> uh, to stop and talk for a little bit. Um, let me get my PowerPoint going here. Just take a second. Uh, today, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I'm calling the post abuelita turn. Uh, I will be talking about Exicanismo and this notion of mestiz XXX, 
Uh, this image that you see here is, uh, it's a cutout from a t-shirt that my dad bought in Chichen Itza when the time we were there when I was little. Chichen Itza, it's, a, it's an archeological site, a cultural site in Southern Mexico, which is a, it's a really beautiful site. And this is one of the stones uh, that carvings that you can see there. And he had this shirt for years and then I stole it from him. And the shirt itself fell apart, but I cut it out and have kept it. And I'm actually gonna get a tattoo of this on my shoulder uh, in, later uh, next month, except that the Jaguar is going to be wearing a little leather jacket and a little, a little leather daddy, black leather daddy cap. And I'll, I'll get, I'll, we'll get into that in a second here. So first, briefly, let me give you some of the background uh, for myself, because this is what I'm trying to build here is a, a, an idea of, um, of the different layers of experience that make up who I am that now have therefore informed my creative practice and that have informed this idea of mestizexxx. So on the, uh, the picture on the left of the field, that uh, is my maternal side. This is, that's my grandfather with one of my uncles. Um, they so my my grandfather and grandmother immigrated to uh, the U.S. from Mexico um, in the like the 40s. So it was during the Braceros program where uh, Mexican laborers were being invited to legally come and work in the United States, mostly a lot in California and the sort of southern western uh, agricultural areas because everybody else was at war, right? And so these Mexican laborers were invited to work. Uh, in the fields, and so he was one of those one of those people, uh, and so that that was my maternal side. They were um, working class farmers, and then on my dad's side, uh, very interestingly, uh, the, my dad's my 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 paternal grandparents were Baptists, and my which is kind of weird for for Mexicans, right? It's a you know kind of traditionally Catholic Mexican Catholic um, culture. But in terms of you know the Christian the Christian roots there, but yeah they were Baptists and so my grandfather kind of middle class um, certainly upper middle class for their context in Mexico and my dad uh, he's the one seated the little guy seated on the very on the far left there they're they're an intense family I I I have I'll say right now I I don't I don't get on for reasons having to do with me being trans and queer. Um, and other reasons too. I, I'm not close, very close with either side, but I'm definitely less close with the paternal side. Again, kind of intense people. <laughs> but my parents met in uh, in a very an important context. So you know, they met in the in the 70s, the 80s, uh, in Los Angeles, California, and um, during that time. Uh, that was kind of the boom of the Chicano movement. And so the Chicano movement, I, I mean, it began, you know, pretty early back, you know, during the, in the forties into the fifties, there was kind of the, the what would come to be uh, the roots with, you know, Cesar Chavez leading, organizing farm workers and other laborers. Um, but into the seventies and eighties, that, that kind of political movement also kind of had a, this was really developing a cultural root, right? And and that's where we start seeing people like Gloria Saldua and Sherry Moraga coming up with their you know really wonderful important cultural theories in terms of yeah as, answering these questions of what does it mean to be uh, you know Mexicans living in the United States context, right? And there were some really important um, kind of core questions arising around ideas of indigeneity there. Um, one one of the reasons for that was just that you know during this the, the you know kind of civil rights era, there was a lot of really important coalition happening between the um, American Indian movement as well as the Black Rights movements. Um, you know the the Black Panthers inspired the Brown Berets, which were a kind of the a, a, a Mexican corollary to the Black Panthers. Um, and so, yeah, and so this question of like, well, you know, we're here and working the land, right? But, you know, is this, what does that mean in terms of how we situate ourselves in terms of territory, right? Of course, you know, the, I think that we can broadly understand that the, that the Mexico-US border was an imposed border um, that had a lot of negotiation already between uh, colonial, uh, you, you know, like, um, Spanish and Portuguese and French colonial claims and American colonial claims as well, right? So all of that, all of that was kind of coming into question in the 70s and 80s when my parents meet. 
um, my my dad was involved in the royal was a member of the Royal Chicano Air Force, which was this artist collective, um, who that uh, <laughs> kind of tongue in cheek had named themselves the Royal Chicano Air Force. Um, but they did a lot of zines. They did a lot of really beautiful paintings, um, and then also were creating these cultural sites, uh, cultural events um, that were kind of this this place of bur of a burgeoning um, kind of hybrid. Um, you know, mestiz, mestiza, mestizo uh, culture that was combining um, indigenous roots, the kind of pre-Hispanic indigenous roots with, um, uh, you know, kind of contemporary Mexican Catholic beliefs and, uh, and also having all these other cultural threads from, you know, the, the, the Black rights movement and the American Indian movement, all of these things coming together. Uh, my mom at the time was uh, doing a lot of AIDS advocacy work and doing um, also kind of doing a parenting counseling uh, for a lot of the laborers there. And so, uh, yeah, so this was just, these are two, just two images. This is one of the zines that um, was that my, both of my parents actually worked on. And then this was one of the, one of the ceremonies that you know, cultural events that they uh, helped uh, host. And I mean, right away, there are some, there are some complexities here, right? Um, which I will get into in terms of, you know, what is it, um, what does it mean for, uh, you know, people who are indigenous or have indigenous roots, kind of a mixed indigenous background coming from other, other parts, right? Kind of from Mexican territories going into the US and then having their own, you know, kind of uh, indigenous presence or indigenous expressions of culture in, you know, what is, uh, there are, you know, uh, many, many different nations already existing in California, if we just focus on California. And so, you know, what, what about that? Is there, are there, is there a potential for erasure there, right? In, you know, doing things, if I, sorry, just to hop back, like claiming uh, territory as Aslan, which is something that, um, you know, that uh, Gloria Ansaldúa is, you know, doing, uh, Aslan, you know, in, being a um, an imaginary or a conceptual territory, right? That it has a root in um, Nawa beliefs and philosophies in terms of there being this promised land. And so Aslan becomes this a sort of political territory, right? Or a cultural territory, which is layered on top of other indigenous nations territories. So, uh, my parents were in LA for a bit. They did a lot of organizing there and then they wanted to raise kids, but they didn't want to raise them in LA. So they decided to do kind of a back to the land thing. Um, my, I won't say, you know, so my parents, uh, they had a really beautiful garden. So we moved up to, uh, well, I, at this point, I'm, I've been born. I'm about two years old. Uh, we moved to 17 acres of uh, really beautiful land, forested land in Northern California and like up for north of Sacramento. And um, my parents continue doing their, uh, use it as kind of like a cultural gathering place for other people in Aslan. At this point, my dad, who I will say for, you know, all that he did contribute is a very sketchy person. He was abusing multiple people. He was kind of trying to run a cult here. And luckily he wasn't very good at it. So <laughs> he didn't, he didn't harm that many people in that, in that sense, in terms of, of a cult sense. But uh, yeah, my, you know, my parents were, they did a really good effort. I feel at doing a back to the land thing, but we were not a self-sustaining <laughs> operation, um, but all the same. Uh, they did, you know, raise me and mostly me. My my uh, my sister wasn't born until later. So this is a this is an image that that on the right that's the house that we lived in. It was a, a geodesic dome, pretty pretty hippie core. Um, and then on the left uh, is one of the temascales, the sweat lodges that were built on on the land that then, uh, you know, my parents had many practices and ceremonies around. And so again, you know, again, there's this ambivalence, right? You know, where I grew up in this and on the one hand, you know, I, certainly as an adult looking back, I have a lot of questions and, you know, is this real? Is it, you know, this, a lot of questions around authenticity. My parents, you know, ironically were obsessed with authenticity, right? Um, and so, well, then I asked, well, you know, was this just, just a cult? Was it real? I I was very invested in you know this sort of um, this this chicanismo uh, these spiritual practices. But now you know I really wonder. 
Um, and so, I, you know, I, I kind of came, I, 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 I come back and move away from uh, these questions throughout my life. And uh, I did do a bit of, um, in, in my undergrad studies, I was doing, doing some experimental media around my, you know, Mexican American identity, uh, which, you know, my parents, uh, incidentally, uh, were very, they were very fiercely post-colonial. They rejected, they, when, if I said I was a Mexican American, they did not like that because they said, you're not, you're not American, you're, you're Mexican and you're indigenous is what they would always tell me. But, and yet there I was growing up within an American cultural context. And so I was kind of like, well, I can't say that that's not happening. Now, you know, at this point, this is, the, so this film I made, I think in 2010, the, you, you guys are in the way of the, <laughs> of the year there. But um, yeah, so this film, this was a very short film that I did uh, where I kind of took oral histories uh, from my abuelita. Uh, this is my maternal abuelita with her. I've, I've always had a very good relationship with, very grateful for that. Um, and uh, this is, so, so these, I, I, part of the film, you see these kind of composite images that are composites of both present day images of Hemet, around Hemet, California, the Inland Empire, which is where my grandmother grew up, same where you saw the, that picture of the field. That was the, the same area, which now of course is full of retirement housing and other developments. Um, and these images are composites of that with my, uh, these old photos. So those are, that's my grandfather and other people, other workers he worked with on the right. And then that's my grandmother and my, uh, my holding my mom, I believe, and then with two of my aunts. And so I did a lot of, I was doing a lot of kind of classic, you know, Chicanx, that more, it's more contemporary Chicanx identity searching and a lot of nostalgia, right? There's a lot of nostalgia that's built into Chicanx uh, identities. Chicano, Chicana now having, kind of gone into Chican X, where there's an X to make it gender neutral, right? This was all part of this, this movement forward. And so I, I got very frustrated at the, you know, around 2010 when I was made, making this film because I just felt like we were stuck in this nostalgia and the story, like not, I, again, I love my abuelita. I love her matriarchal and matrilineal, matrilineal power, right? But there is something about, uh, there's almost an objectification of the abuelita that is really has been a part of the last 20 years of Chicanx identities. And so more recently, as I now have been in Canada for the last five years and been having to all, rethink altogether the, my national context, right? Certainly we think kind of a nation, nation state context. I've started revisiting these ideas of like, well, how can we kind of unpack these complexities? I have some terms here. I know some people really like terms. And so <laughs> I, I have fun with them. They're kind of, they're, they're jokes to me. They're kind of tongue in cheek. Um, but so I said, well, what about post abuelita identities, right? When your abuelita, when the, the, if you kind of step back from that nostalgia, that Nost objectifying nostalgia around the abuelita. Uh, what, you know, what, what then? What happens then? Um, and, and also, um, you know, how can we decenter, decenter our identities from these abstracts and, and simulacras of, of what it is to be Mexican, right? Or have Mexican roots. Um, and then Mexican, I said, well, if you're, you know, if maybe I'm not Mexican, maybe I'm an Mexican, maybe Mexico is a kind of an X to me, right? And then the next step was this idea of Mesti Sex X X, which, you know, I, I'll, go, I'll go into that as, as we move forward. But, it, you know, I really see it as not an identity, but I use it as an identity marker in the place where you usually see that. But really, Mesti Sex X X, it's not an identity, it's a methodology, right? It acknowledges my lived experience, my mixedness, um, the ways in which, you know, my, my transness, my being gay, all of these things are, are the grand sum of this, this lived methodology. So here I am in Canada, right? And uh, in Alberta, no less, um, like in Blackfoot, traditional Blackfoot territory, uh, a very, very kind of defamiliarized place for me. And, you know, what it is, Mexicanness is now, talk about simulacras, right? Like I went to Taco Time for the first time and I, I don't know, man, I, it's, yeah, it's, these things are so, they're, they become so distant from their origin that they're almost something completely different, right? They're their own mood altogether. What you're looking at here is a, um, is a 
it's called, what is it called? It's called a UV map, if I remember correctly. And what a UV map is when you make a three dimensional object, a digital three dimensional object, um, it is, it has one of these attached to it. And what it does is that, that I will go ahead and play this. Um, that uh, is kind of the skin that wraps around the three-dimensional object. So I did this as part of a, a research project I was working on that is making digital, um, digital, digital versions of Blackfoot objects. Two minutes, are, Pinta. Sorry, eight. two minutes. What's that? How many? Two minutes. Two minutes? All right. So, yeah. So what I did was I, I took um, these images, these stills of places that I have kind of moved through throughout my life, places I've lived, trying to acknowledge all these different indigenous territories and saying, and then putting those all scrambled back on those digital boots to kind of express that this, this idea again of like, well, how, how do we map or unmap these territories that we move through? And how does this all kind of layer upon itself to become part of our identities, or in my case, right, my, my identities. How do we acknowledge those territories? Oops. So um, I, I think I'll provide. I'll put this in the in the chat later on. I wrote. I kind of took Mesty XXX and and created what an auto theory of it. There's some really wonderful auto theories. Uh, work around thinking auto theories. Uh, being like different methodologies or, or ways that uh, creative people are, are self-describing or self-situating. And this was featured um, in these really wonderful uh, publications. So there's a, a, a digital version of it. And then there's a hard copy that this is, my work just has a, um, an excerpt in the hard copy, but I do recommend it. Some excellent work in both of these. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll skip this one because you can just look at it. Basically, that's all. That's all in the um, in the thing. And I'll just end with uh, quickly with this um, this project, my doctoral project, <laughs> which is a, a postcolonial theme park where I am creating uh, a, another conceptual territory. Um, but really, I mean, it's, it's a little, it's very perverse in that I am purposefully reappropriating um, things that theme parks and world's fairs, freak shows, circuses, all of these have such a, have had such an ability to uh, shape our notions of the other and of race and of sexuality and perversity, all of these things. Um, Disney, right? Disney has formed, is such a powerhouse of forming um, national identities um, and so cultural identities. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to take that and I'm going to see what happens when you create a post-colonial theme park. What kind of, um, of narratives can you, or truths can you uh, enforce or make? And just very quickly, one of the, just to, as our last thing, one of the attractions that you will be able to experience at Sintlan is a, um, is this, um, uh, what, what is it called? It's like the Garden of Toppled Monuments, where you will be able to see, uh, it will be a virtual, a virtual space that you can walk through and, and just see all of these, you know, the, the sort of uh, dethroned Confederate soldier, the headless Columbus, uh, it, with this idea that it's a, it is in a redressing or a correction of history, right? And so in the videos, I'll also drop this link, in the videos that, I, that I've done addressing this, I'm really satirizing um, Disney's Walt Disney's op Disneyland opening videos, where he is really creating place through just making statements about it, right? These givens, and so that's kind of how this park functions. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I I'm not even. I don't even. I'm not even. I don't want. I want. Just want to show you this image because I don't actually have this articulated very well. This is fresh work. So, but I will leave you with these two images in in your minds. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Miguel Cinta. It's, it's very interesting to see uh, and start talking about this conceptual territory as a space of negotiation, but also a space where you question this authenticity of this kind of spiritual practices and then uh, and uh, finishing with this postcolonial theme park, Sintlan. Uh, so uh, we are going to continue uh, the discussion. <clears throat> with our next 
panelist, Rodrigo Dalcántara, uh, which is uh, who is sorry a transnational and multidisciplinary Brazilian visual artist, filmmaker, and current PhD student in the interuniversitary uh, doctoral program in art history at Concordia University. He holds a master's degree in visual arts from the School of Fine Arts of Universidade Federal de Rio de Janeiro and a bachelor's degree in plastic arts uh, from the Universidade de Brasilia. Uh, his theoretical and practical research, which uh, sheds light on counter hegemonic narratives from a syncretic perspective, have been shared internationally in countries such as Argentina, Austria, Brazil, Belgium, Canada, Chile, France, Germany, Greece, among others. So, Rodrigo, muchas gracias. Te doy la palabra. Muchas gracias a ti, Nuria. También, Carol, I want to say thank you to everyone that made this panel possible, this roundtable discussion. Um, I'm really thrilled to go after Miguel Zinta. It was really good to hear you. Um, let me start sharing my screen. Just a minute. So I am a Brazilian uh, researcher and visual artist. And so I don't like to compartmentalize my knowledge and separate my theoretical research from my practice. So in the beginning of my presentation, I will try to, to entangle these two worlds. Um, so here in the left, I brought uh, uh, some illustrations, some oil paintings by Albert Eckhout from the, uh, the 17th century. Uh, in contrast with a uh, recent uh, piece of digital art by myself that um, displays some of my, <clears throat> my patriarchs from my own genealogy. Um, so basically, like when happened the encounter of the Portuguese uh, colonizers in Brazil, um, all the, the depictions that we have, all the historical accounts that we have um, showing the, the identities that lived here back then were done by a colonial gaze, were done by uh, the European artistic missions, uh, especially the French artistic missions, but also by Dutch and, and French uh, and Portuguese artists. Um, so yeah, a lot of people don't know, but we also had some Dutch and French colonization in Brazil. And I brought these images for us to reflect on how these European depictions helped to create stereotypes and, and exotifications about these identities. And also they created some patterns regarding mestizaje, regarding miscegenation, uh, and the mixing of races and even the, the very creation of a racial theory and the division, the segregation through racia racialization um, that not necessarily was, were concepts back then, like before the, the idealization of the new world. Um, so this all happened through uh, something that a lot of scholars and artists nowadays are calling uh, colonial fantasies or white saddle mythologies. So I'm coming from this background. Um, and here in this, uh, these illustrations, you can see in the first one, uh, Tapuya indigenous person being portrayed as a cannibal. And this was really common. Um, and also there was this homogenization of indigenous and African Afro diasporian identities in this whole process. So I, I, I want you to keep this in mind, like how um, these European missions um, and our, the very idea of Western art history supported these stereotypes that we still have until nowadays. And this work that I, I, I did, uh, call it patriarchal genealogy or the last patriarch on the right, um, originally, it was meant to be a urban intervention. I did this as an urban intervention as well, like with um, gluing some some prints of these patriarchs and myself, uh, my own image, 
um, in the gallery and in the urban space. And the idea was to be kind of like an altar, a ephemeral altar. That just, a, just a question. Are, are you changing the slides? Because we, we are in- No, the no. I'm still talking yeah. about this uh, GIF, this GIF. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, this, this work was meant to talk about this erasure of different identities and how like in the end, and throughout this process of uh, colonization and the creation of the modern subject in Brazil, there was an idea of uh, whitening our identities and creating a common signifier of the modern subject as um, the white mestizo, right? Like as myself, for example, as someone that is white passing um, in Brazil and in the Brazilian uh, racial discourses. So there was a, a, a really strong process of raising other identities. And usually only people that have uh, strictly European heritage know about their ancestors in Brazil. Um, and then my practice goes in this direction of recovering this um, mestizo identity and understanding these other uh, systems of beliefs that are rooted in the Brazilian identity as well in, in my own perception of the world. Um, I brought just some fragments of my production. Um, I usually work with performance and video art um, but also I draw and I, I consider myself a multidisciplinary artist. And so, uh, but here I chose to go with this more genealogical approach so we can discuss Mr. Sai. Uh, and I brought a, a sentence um, from a, a contemporary catalog, an exhibition that happened last year, a really important one called The Great Return of the Tupinamba Mentos. So the Tupinamba nation was the main uh, indigenous nation uh, that uh, inhabited Brazil before it was Brazil, before uh, the creation of uh, this colonial project. And it was actually like they were different uh, nations, but the, the colonizers kind of put it, put it all of them together in this category of Tupinamba or the Tupi. Um, and they were around like 2 million individuals. And um, recently I have been uh, researching about the Tupinamba people and their contributions uh, regarding feather work and the sensory system uh, of the feather work practice that we can, we can find a lot of resonance in uh, Mexican art as well. Uh, with the Nahua and the Aztecs. Um, but he, in Brazil, the Tupinamba feather work was mainly done in this format of cloaks, of mantles. They call it, they call these objects mantles. And they, they think the, the mantles are their spiritual ancestors. They are not only objects, but they come from this very idea that's really common in indigenous cultures as well. Uh, that objects are embedded with spiritual energy and they themselves are uh, ancestors, right? Like they are not ordinary objects. And there is a really complex network of um, things that operate behind the creation of these mantles, but I will not get in so many details because we don't have time here. Um, but uh, for me, it was really fascinating as I was studying as I am studying this uh, history of Tupinamba, um, I started to, to feel impacted in my own symbolic systems. Uh, and I started to dream about some, um, some symbolisms that are connected with the Tupinamba people and the Caboclo identity. The Caboclo identity is um, a signifier of the mestizo uh, between Europeans and indigenous in Brazil. And also uh, it's the name of an archetype in the Umbanda religion. Umbanda is a, a secretist uh, uh, contemporary religion in Brazil that incorporates um, Afro-indigenous um, symbolisms to the, the Catholic iconography. 
So, and they, they, mer they merge together all the saints with the Orishas and also invoke some indigenous archetypes. So I started to dream about some of these uh, archetypes and I felt that somehow my research was connecting with my dreams. And in this catalog of this uh, exhibition, um, there is this sentence, Tupinaba is the king of Jurema, Tupinaba or Rei de Jurema. Uh, and Jurema is the name of my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. And so I made this direct association to jump into my own practice. And I also want to talk about how like the presence of the mental in my family comes from a Catholic perspective, a syncretist Catholic or a popular Catholic, as we say in Brazil, like Catholicism popular, uh, that incorporates um, these narratives in a really embedded way, like it's not explicit. Uh, it's kind of uh, hidden, hidden in the, the systems of belief because it was a way of resistance right throughout uh, colonialism and the updates of colonialism that we still have operating in Brazil and worldwide. Uh, so for me, I started to create this idea that also, um, like when I am portraying the, the Catholic mantle of the Holy Mary here in my grandmother, I am also uh, incorporating previous ancestors uh, in this iconography. And this mantle, and it's this specific mental is from the Virgin Mary of Aparecida, uh, Nossa Senhora da Aparecida. Uh, and for the, the Latin America community, it's really common to think about all these different versions of the Holy Mary and the Virgin Mary. And when we start to study this iconography, uh, it's really fascinating as well because this uh, variety of Virgin Marys also are a way of syncretism, are a way of thinking about uh, the merging of other divinities that came before colonialism and how they needed to be um, resignified by the mestizo identities and they inhabit these images as well. So when we talk about um, Catholic images in Latin America and in Brazil, like we are not only talking about uh, Catholic uh, meanings, right? And this specific Virgin Mary is the Black Virgin Mary because there is a story in Brazil that this Black Virgin Mary was rescued from a river by the fisherman. That's why she, she has this iconography of the two fishes here and the net. So everything is kind of re, re, uh, related and entangled, right? So the name of this, this, is, this was the um, last video art that I did in collaboration with my grandmother and my mother. Uh, it's called Jurema Sagrada, Sacred Jurema. I did it in collaboration also with Marta Supernova uh, that did the soundtrack. And the lettering was by Shika Lalaika. <laughs> uh, this lettering that uh, also communicates with Augusto de Campos, which is a concretist Brazilian artist. Uh, and I bring all these ideas of um, diaspora and syncretism of Catholic imagery with um, non-white ancestors, right? That uh, how I could rescue this non-white uh, iconology from my own uh, background. Uh, and it's kind of like a retrofuturistic aesthetic. And I really like to play with this um notion of nonlinear times in my works and to disrupt with uh, the binarisms of Western uh, thought. And these are some digital collages that I produced as part of this video art uh, that they are called the mat matriarchal in science. They are part as well of another series of mine that's called self-declaration series um, in which I specifically uh, navigate in this um, genealogy aspect. And 
this first one, uh, the matriarchal sign number three, uh, especially depicts myself with my matriarchs, like some of my matriarchs, my grandmother and my aunt and my mom. And it's my aunt's wedding in Colombia. And I also have a relationship with Colombia. I have always been traveling to Colombia since I am a child. As you can see, I was three years old in this picture. And uh, so for me, it's also like thinking about archive in this really organic way, this vivid way where I can appropriate my own family uh, imagery and create another thing and um, reactivate some symbolisms that um, were not uh, necessarily outspoken, right? And I made them explicit. And there is a whole relationship between these pearls and um, the number of children that my grandmother had and the children that she lost as well. She only gave birth to women and the, the men that she gave birth were dead uh, right after they were born. So there, there's a lot of implicit narratives here and also uh, this mixing between orishas and and sands. Uh, what happened? Sorry. Two minutes, Rodrigo. Thank you. And this is another video art uh, from the same series. Call it uh, this series is called Syncretic Series. Um, this was the second one. Jurema Sagrado or Sacred Jurema was the fourth. Uh, so it's an ongoing process in my research. Uh, it's kind of an open book. And in Capicara, I also rescue some Tupi words. Capicara comes from capivara, the animal, um, and cacara, which is a bird in the savannas where I was raised in Brazil, in the Cerrado. Uh, so I just merged together these two uh, animals from the savannas that um, originated from Tupi, the Tupi language, and created this myth uh, mythological being called Capicara. Um, and it's like a, a narrative where this, um, this character, the Brazilian, Bra Bra Brasileira, she's preparing an offer for the, the, uh, the entity, Capicara, and there, there is kind of this um, overlapping between the appearances of uh, this kind of supernatural being and the process of doing an offer, right, for a spiritual um, helm. And I talk a lot about memory, and there are some tropical elements as well as the fruits that she's offering, and this mix of dream and dream and real. And it's kind of an anti-colonial fantasy for me. And there is this fragment um, that is in, in the introduction of the movie. The memory of the devastated land pulsates beneath the advance of the so-called new world. Capicara is conceived by the encounter of matrices originating from the old world, announcing that once violated, the sacred ground will always revolt and awaken the intangible and inexplicable. So for me, like my practice also tries to, to support this idea that the spiritual realm is there, is it still operating even though the, the contemporary instances try to erase this bond with our spirituality. And here I'm talking um, in a broader spectrum. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking more about spirituality and how um, this abstract thinking about reality is present, right, in my life and it's present in a lot of people's lives. And I think they are always um, kind of ha having some agency in our everyday life, even though we don't acknowledge them sometimes. So I think that's it for now. Thank you so much. Gracias, Rodrigo. Thank you uh, for bringing this idea of questioning the mestizo identity that brings other systems of beliefs that questions the colonial gaze uh, and brings these sensory systems uh, uh, like the tupi and this spiritual 
background. So <clears throat> we are going to uh, continue our panel with Esteban Perez, uh, who graduated from Emily Carr University of Arts and Designs with an MFA degree in 2021. His work has been part of exhibitions such as uh, Radical uh, Rewarding at AVA Gallery at UBC, uh, Triplet in No Lugar, and Premio Brasil uh, in Centro de Arte Contemporáneo. In 2019, he had his first solo exhibition, uh, Transitory, uh, in Mas Arte. He was selected for the Premio Brasil Arte Emergente, an award founded by the Brazilian Embassy in Quito for the promotion of emerging artists. And in 2020, he was the recipient of the Odeon Travel Award in Vancouver. And uh, in 2021, uh, he was an artist in residence uh, at the Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver and also at the Simil Camin uh, studio residency uh, organized by the Griffin Art Projects. So Esteban, uh, la palabra es tuya. Uh, muchas gracias por la introducción. Thank you for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Esteban Perez. I am an artist from Ecuador and I am currently based in the unceded territories of the Masquium, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations, colonially known as Vancouver. Uh, I want to thank Sur Gallery and Nuria for organizing this panel and the symposium. I also want to say that I'm very excited to be here and share my work with you. Um, I want to start by giving a short explanation of what it means to be mestizo for me. The term has a colonial history that claims a mix or hybridity between indigenous people with the Spanish colonizer. The children of the Spanish that were born in the so-called new continent were called criollos. And any mixture between European and indigenous or African was labeled in broader terms, mestizo. This position in the middle of the hierarchy created by the Spanish is fundamental for understanding the mestizo mentality, which means feeling oppressed by the Spanish or white Europeans and exercising an oppressive power towards the indigenous people. So essentially, it is a hybrid and contradictory identity where the oppressor and the oppressed are simultaneously embodied in the same person. Even though I recognize the indigenous features on my face, at the same time, I feel an ontological distance between me and the indigenous, indigenous nations of Ecuador. This is mainly because of my upbringing, which was based on Western values. So it is in this alienating hybrid contradiction that I position myself as a mestizo listener from the global South. Being aware of this asymmetrical relation between mestizo and indigenous, I attempt to move beyond this extractive gaze that benefits and extracts from indigenous ways of knowing. So in my work and under the concept of frequency, I would like to attune myself to a reciprocal relationship with Andean logics. For me, it is not about salvaging or rescuing ancient, way, ancient ways of knowing from the Andes region, it is about talking to them and learning from them since they are very much alive after 500 years of resistance. So now I will present some of my work that I created in the last three years. And I'll start by saying that I arrived in Canada in 2019 to study an MFA at Emily Carr University. And in my first weeks of class, I noticed that before an event or class, faculty were doing a land acknowledgement every time. This was new to me, and I had never heard of that before I arrived in Vancouver. Since I was new in Canada, I thought that I might as well ask what this means. So I approached Connie Watts, an indigenous artist and director of the Aboriginal gathering place at Emily Carr. And I asked her if she could explain what the land acknowledgement was. Also, 
she explained important for the First Nations people in Canada. After this clarification, I mentioned to Connie my idea for the Earth Project, and I asked her if she could recommend me to local Indigenous artists. So she contacted me with Aaron Nelson Moody, also known as Splash, a Squamish artist. Splash agreed to collaborate with me on the Earth Project. We met at a mall in North Vancouver, where he asked me why I wanted to do this. I replied that the origin of my idea was a feeling of frustration of not being able to freely move or travel the world without a visa. He understood my motivation and we drove to his house looking for a shovel. Now, I realized that during the morning, that morning, I was learning so much about First Nations people in Canada. For instance, Aaron took me to his house that was located on a reserve in North Vancouver. He also showed me his ID that labeled him as an indigenous person. I was really surprised. Then I told him that for the project, I will just follow him wherever he will take me. I just trusted the process and followed him. So once we arrived in the forest, he said that he needed to ask permission from his ancestors before collecting the earth. So after he sang a song and played a drum, we both gave thanks to the earth and to the ancestors. Then we proceeded with the earth's recollection. It is nice that from the very beginning of the project, there was always musicality involved. During the performance, we were talking about the idea of a hybrid identity. He mentioned that when he was a child, he was being bullied by white kids because he was indigenous. And when he went back to the reserve, he was being bullied by indigenous kids because he looked too white. That resonated with me and with my own hybrid contradictory mestizo identity. After the performance, the box of earth was lying in my studio and I didn't know what to do with it. At the same time, I was doing research on sound synthesis and sound waves. And that's how I came up with the idea for the earth synthesizer a black 3D printed box that generates a sound once its copper cables are connected to the earth and to a speaker. I simply sought to listen to this earth, the one that we collected with Splash. From this moment, I saw the earth as another collaborator with agency and subjectivity in my work. The next piece is called Bifurcación Sonora. And it was inspired by a short story by Jorge Luis Borges, Tlón Ukbar Orbis Tertius, written in 1962. Ukbar is an imaginary country that becomes real after its history is incorporated into the history books. In this work, I was interested in the idea of how social narratives dictate and give form to the reality that we live in. So I created a sculpture made of earth bricks, but each brick was made of a mix of unceded territory, First Nations land and water. At the same time, the room was filled with the amplified sound of the earth, recorded, recorded from the place where the First Nations earth was collected. With this, I was exploring how different temporalities collide in the same space. Uh, in the next works, I use a similar strategy for the sound pieces. This means stretching and amplifying field recordings in order to create an abstract sound composition. In Liquid Beings, I created a series of drawings made with red cedar pigment, a gift from Splash. The drawings were made while listening to the sound composition. 
I was interested in visualizing the frequencies and vibrancies of the earth. The sound was being played from a hanging speaker and filled the space where the drawings were being displayed. Uh, my next piece, Liquid Land, was also the culmination of the Earth Project. Liquid Land is an installation informing indigenous ways of knowing from Ecuador and by ideas that Splash shared with me during our collaboration. The work attempts to stop seeing nature and the forest through an extractive gaze, where nature is only a commodity and an object that needs, that needs to be exploited for capitalist profit, and instead tries to understand the complex living ecosystem of the forest, where more than human entities, human bodies, and spirits from the past meet. For this piece, I returned the brick sculpture to the forest, for rain, snow, and wind to dissolve the ideological divisions embedded in the land narrative. The slow process of decomposition forces the viewer to experience a different sense of time, a more than human time. And this last piece is called Ashnola's Granular Ice, and it was made during a residency in Kermios in the Semilkamin Valley. It is a sound composition based on photographs that were used as a scores, I created a series of photographs of ice layers that I found on the Ashnola River. For me, the images resemble sound waves, so I perceive them as a natural sound score of frozen frequencies. Then I recorded, recorded with a contact mic several sounds that were later used for the creation of a composition with a granular synthesizer. The idea of dissolving sound of frozen frequencies into grains attempted to access different temporalities of the river. The piece attunes to indigenous auditory logics related to the natural world, and it is informed by grounded normativity, an idea proposed by scholars Glenn Coldhart and Liani Betasamusaki Simpson that proposes a relation to the land based on respect and reciprocity. So now we, I will play an excerpt from the sound. I hope you can hear it. That was the last one of the last sound compositions that I made, and also this is the direction in which I would like to take my practice to. Uh, however, I try to uh, keep in mind the complexity of the term mestizo. Uh, I think it's important to think and understand the position from which I listen and I speak, which is the global south. Thank you for listening. Hmm. Gracias. Gracias, Esteban, for bringing this idea of the mestizo as a listener of the global south that also brings this musicality of uh, this hybrid identity. So we are going to pass to our uh, last presentation, Carlos Colin, uh, who is a visual artist, uh, pedagogue and PhD candidate uh, in the Interdisciplinary Studies graduate program 
at the University of British Columbia. His research topics explore and connects the core cultural, theoretical, political, religious, and artistic manifestations of Baroque as a colonial legacy in contemporary Mexico and in Latin America, and by extension, its diasporas. He studied his undergraduate program in visual communication and design and a Master of Fine Arts at the National School of Fine Arts at uh, UNAM in Mexico City. Uh, he has a second Master of Fine Arts at the University of British Columbia at uh, UBC. Uh, Colin has exhibited his artwork in venues such as Aramauca Contemporary Art Platform in Chiapas, Mexico, the Rich uh, Gallery Museum, the Grund Gallery in Vancouver, Sur Gallery in Toronto, Galleria de la Raza in San Francisco, and Rufino Tamayo Museum in Mexico City. Colleen was awarded the 2016 Emerging Artists uh, Majors Art Award for the City of Vancouver in Visual Arts, the 2016-17 uh, sorry Artist Studio Award Program, and most recently he participated in the Bienal, uh, Bienal Sur in Argentina. Carlos, eh, a ti la palabra. Gracias, Nuria. Um, thank you, Nuria. Uh, thank you, Sur Gallery. And uh, I'm just happy to be here with all of you and share the panel with uh, Esteban Rodrigo and Miguel, Miguel Cinta. And uh, yeah, I'm going to start sharing my, uh, my screen and my presentation. And I would like to start with this word, uh, Tlanelogy. It's a, a Nahuatl word that I'm going to explain during uh, my presentation. The, um, for me, um, it's, of course, I would, I would like to talk about my, my, my own perspective and, and my idea about what happened to me also being in Vancouver or being in Canada. I was born in Mexico, um, in Guadalajara and raised in Mexico City for 30 years. I lived there for 30 years. I came from a public, uh, from a pluri-ethnic background family within, uh, from my family, my extended family, uh, mainly from the center in the south of Mexico with, uh, of course, indigenous Afro-Mexican and European heritage. So the, the, I am the result uh, of the colonial and postmodern experiences of grafting identities and shaping utopic visualizations about Latin America from Latin America. Nationality uh, is a cultural decision and uh, personally speaking on my practice and my theory, I have specifically no intention to be explaining Canada beyond just being Mexican and Latin American. I grew up with that, with that ideology. I, I grew up with those perspectives. And um, sorry, I'm just gonna, there you go. So when I came, uh, I came 10 years ago to Canada. So I was, I was a grown up um, artist, let's say in that aspect. So at some point when I tried to, when I came and I tried to uh, understand the concept that, or the, the, the notion of what Canada means, the, the, the territory that I'm, that I'm living and working right now, um, it, was, uh, it was a confrontation in the process of also how I understand, not just the process of mestizaje, but where I came from. I was too white to have indigenous background, and I'm not too white to be having European background, right? So at some point, um, I deal with these processes in terms of how uh, I'm not a white Sican, but on the other hand, try to connect also with some uh, indigenous artists and, and, and thinkers and, and, and the students in UBC was more like asking always, what was my indigenous background? So these kind of things eventually in Mexico, I never had that, that, that position to, to to think about myself in that in that concept, I don't say that uh, in Mexico we don't have racism of classism because we're still having it as uh, all over Latin America and Canada, of course, exist those approximations. But I feel lucky to came from a family where um, all these things never were a problem. Um, I was educated in the process that we're all the same, 
uh, we all have the same opportunities and I don't need to see other people on top or, or below me. So I was, I, I really, I, I was grateful for that experience. And one of the first works that I want to show is this one, Sur is here. Uh, in, in 2019, the exhibition Estéticas Estridentes Hacia Una Nueva Liberación, Aesthetics, uh, Strident Aesthetics, The Words, A uh, New Liberation. I made the artwork, Sur is here were associated with Latin American conceptualist thoughts, practice and didactics to immerse new publics in an understanding of Latin American art that engage with social movements, resistance and subversive movements as part of a larger cultural movement in the region. The artwork series here symbolize my position here uh, about the notion of here and there, like the, the situation that I'm producing, I'm working and living in Canada, but I am always have let's say my brain and my, my theory, my knowledge uh, in Latin America. Uh, that's my research and I, I keep to maintain, to maintain that process. In 2020, uh, I create this piece, uh, Columbre, which I found the word um, glimpsed, I think is the, is the most closest, uh, closest word for Columbre. Um, from the series, from the series La Cintura Cosmica del Sur, The Cosmic Weight of the South. It, it was an exercise about uh, a mental distance, despite seeing Latin America from afar and maybe being disconnected. Uh, my concepts and practices are always attempting to connect with my region. Uh, it gives me perspective from one place to another. And part of this, this project uh, consists of three rocks that I found in the beach on Denman Island here in British Columbia walking with my partner and, and our son. Uh, my partner was telling uh, our son that if he wants to take some rocks back home, he needs to feel them and understand that the rocks want to go home with him. Uh, think about this idea while I was walking with them. I found these three rocks where I glimpsed the Latin American region, I understand that my mind is always in the south of the Rio Bravo. I had the privilege um, been here uh, to know uh, of known Ileana, Naum, and Eric from SOTS Collective. I think uh, SOTS Collective is one of the most important Latin American art collectives in Canada. And I see on their work as collective and individually uh, this idea of being pure from their own impure identity. Uh, and I'm able to connect with them in how we use materials, knowledge, experiences, and meanings. Uh, one of the things that I found in Sots Collective was this idea of how they work together, make this kind of like drawings, collage, this murals perspective, always coming from their own perspectives, try to add always something new. And I think that's also part of um, my idea in terms of how I produce artwork in, in Canada or how I produce Latin American artwork or contemporary art, art in, 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 in Canada. This piece was thinking about them, thinking in the process of how sometimes we're uh, like shamans uh, transforming and creating like new universes in the places that probably we don't have the chance or, or we need to speak out loud to create them, right? So this is for thoughts, and this is part of the series grafts that I, I create uh, as part of the exhibition in Aramauca. Also working there, I, I try to work more in the process of contextual perspectives. So I ponder based on the knowledge from uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui about uh, trabajar lo cheje or working on the cheje uh, as an imperative action. Cheje means uh, gray in Aymara. And Silvia supports the creation of a balance between or medley of identities, combining and articulating individual and community at the same time. Like we're stained, mixed and impure. Uh, Cheje, uh, I can connect and I was thinking about building all these processes in terms of how you understand the mix or mestizaje. And for example, the word in Nahuatl is uh, neshtik, which means gray. And tlanelogi means something mixed, uh, stirred or whipped. So I was trying to know specifically like create this kind of like a crash with Sylvia, but at some point try to understand what she mentioned from her own background on my personal background. 
So I found in, in the Czech perspective, this idea of, as she also explained, the process of we have our Western side like well formed. Now we need to form our indigenous side or our Afro Latin American side, like and combine it as for example, Rodrigo or uh, Miguel Cinta is doing it in some aspects. And that's how listening all of them also I connect with Esteban in the process that how we understand also this idea of mestizaje and how Esteban also create this process of trying to be closer also to that kind of indigenous perspective. So at the end, uh, what is the body but a graft? Y que es el cuerpo sino un injerto? Despite of the notion of, uh, despite the notion about mestizaje as a colonial description of race and as a baroque construction, there is no such a thing as purity. We are graft entities. Y que es el cuerpo sino un injerto is an exercise about impurity from the conception of purity as part of one's identity. I understand the notion of mestizaje in our times, including the diaspora, in the way that Sil uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui described it as the pachuima, live like a divided soul, where our complexes are reflected according to how we recognize ourselves from one point to another, sometimes indigenous, sometimes Westerners, to fit in a post-national society, as Canada described itself as post-national uh, country whatever that means, of course, in this geopolitical perspective. But um, in the diaspora or the Latin American diaspora in countries like Canada, it can be very easy, it, it can be very easy to fall into the Pachuima perspective. Uh, the privilege of the cultural and social ethos is elevated from the Western point of view, the European in us. And from, the time, to, and from time to time, we felt indigenous from the folklore, cliches and stereotypes. We're not all Latin American. Uh, we're not all Latin American institutions. Uh, sometimes we act or they act as uh, pachuimas. We try to represent our identities through our traditions, but at some point we're not focused also in the problems that exist in the diaspora, like um, the, the agricultural workers that come every year, for example. They're also Latin Americans. They also participate in the diaspora. We have this disconnection uh, between culture and reality sometimes, and we need to also like make that balance. And the concept of Pachuima is that also based on this mestizo perspective, we create, or we need to be aware also how we, as a community, we create uh, classism within our diaspora. Not everybody comes with the same privilege. Not everybody has the same privilege in Canada. And also we need to be aware of that. I prefer work in that aspects, despite of or being apart from consulates and have these kind of governmental immersion that eventually create a foggy perspective in the way that also how institutions work. So at the end, um, it was an exercise, as I said before, as part of the same series grafts in Aramauca in Chiapas. As I said before, I also, uh, I, I, I try to work in the contextual perspective, try to work also with the things that uh, my environment provides. And this, this artwork in particular was creating this idea of impurity based on also how we perceive indigenous communities or how we see or us as uh, into the Mexican identity circumstances or simulacras as well, right? Also how we create this process of just one point of view, institutionally speaking, and then eventually, uh, just separate uh, the rest. So for this project, I invited, um, I, I want to create the artwork, not invited. I don't like the, uh, I don't like invite people to the artwork when participate uh, on it. Um, they were able, or uh, I participate with them in the process of create their own bodies, create their own graphs and try to understand that process about purity, mestizaje, and uh, how at the end we're a mix of everything, not just in Mexico, not just in Latin America, uh, worldwide. So at the end, we create this kind of collage, uh, family tree perspective in the, in the wall. The interesting thing is uh, part of the exercise at the beginning of the, uh, of the opening, I ask um, the, the director of Aramauca, Adriana, uh, to place the first two uh, pieces, like these first two. And the interesting thing was that she put it exactly as a male and female 
as this in the center of everything. And eventually people just start adding uh, everything um, around it. More Baroque, it couldn't be. Uh, this idea of how we also conceive, not just, not just through the religious perspective, but also the way that also we analyze the perspective of family or communities always in these kind of family tree circumstances. It was an amazing exercise. And I think um, um, I'm, I'm proud in the way that how uh, together we create and we think those processes, specifically in, 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 in San Cristobal de las Casas or Chiapas, like also this analysis about uh, mestizaje or mix. But also um, for me, um, it's not just think about it, it's also destroying it. And it's also destroying the process through the academy or through the institutions. Uh, la Quiscayoto de la Institución or the end of the institution is uh, uh, also part of the, uh, the cosmic weight of the South destroying the institutionality of the Latin American diaspora means uh, for me, of course, bringing different visions within the establishment that also we are creating. The diaspora has different diasporas from burgeoning immigrants, exiled people to agricultural workers. La Quiscayotl de la Institución is a statement about how we need to create new meanings from the institutional slash community center perspectives mm -hmm. from the academy, passing from visual arts, citizens, and of course the academy. Um, the Cosmic Weight of the South was based on uh, the song by Mercedes Sosa, La Cintura Cosmica del, del Sur. And um, the positionality was in that process of uh, the idea of being identified in the process of how, I, how I'm doing artwork. Living and working in Vancouver or Canada doesn't mean that I need to produce the Canadian way or I don't need to always connect through uh, or contribute specifically to this context. It's also how we connect abroad and how we create this intersectionality among us. And also the, the commitment for me, not just as an artist, but also as a, uh, as a part of a, a member of a community is also try to link with the people around. And that is why I always have in my head this, I think amazing and strong and powerful expression or or, or concept that Lucas Avendaño, a Mushe artist and anthropologist from the Tehuantepec Itzum in Oaxaca, Mexico, express the idea is, porque ni siquiera tengo la necesidad o el deseo de ser explicado, because I don't even feel the need or desire to be explained. And of course, a paradox in some aspects is ironic if I consider myself Mexican and Latin America, but eventually, for me, the notion is travel always through the South. Try was uh, always connect in this trajinera trip, right? Uh, to, to the land that I believe I connect. As I said before, at the beginning of the, my presentation, I think um, nationality is, a, is, a, is, a, is an identity choice. And I prefer, or I am always trying to look into um, the Latin American philosophy and concepts, always something that enrich my practice. I agree with Silvia, again, just to conclude, uh, to, uh, with Silvia Rivera Cosicanque in the process that we have our own knowledge, we have our own uh, philosophy, good or bad, that is always, of course, our commitment to keep evolving through that process. And she has always this um, kind of like a fight with the Western uh, theories that came from the Western Academy. I, I, I appreciate that also she mentioned that because even living here in Canada create that kind of perspective as well. I try to reject it as much as I can, but always at the same time try to contributing through that process as well. So yeah, for me, travel to the South is always, is always the choice. And the process of mestizaje is for me, the conception of we are impure. It doesn't matter how we look ourselves, ourselves at, at the mirror, like we're always impure. So thank you so much. And that was my presentation. Gracias, Carlos. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this idea of, of the mestizo, not just as this Baroque construction of purity, but also as this mental space of disconnection and connections that creates this 
very complex cultural cartography that you depict uh, through your work. So we have 10 minutes. Um, just uh, let me see the chat. Um, so it's the time to open for questions uh, with the public and a dialogue with the public. So uh, if you want to intervene, please, you can use the chat. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to wrap up, uh, hoping that we are going to have a few questions. So it seems to me that we have talked a lot about uh, territoriality about uh, uh, this territory that is not only seen in a geographical term, like a geographical space, but also as this conceptual, even symbolic, and some of you even uh, uh, talk about this imaginary place where nation or where ideas of national or cultural and gender identities are questioned and also are redefined. Uh, we also saw through the presentations that we have seen different landscapes that repositions also, I would say, the body, the bottom, the south, as you were saying, Carlos. And uh, in many ways, uh, the idea of mestizaje uh, uh, brings this idea of exclusionary uh, and that brings also the origins of racism in Latin America. But we have seen in these presentations uh, from the north, and I would say from the northern do double border of Canada, that uh, when we think also about mestizaje, we think about this border thinking space or a space of collective consciousness uh, that challenge the cultural stereotypes, that challenge also uh, Miguel Cinta, as you said, nostalgia, for example, no? Uh, and uh, also that tra is traversed, uh, we have seen by transness, queerness, and the particular positioning that these concepts and uh, brings. So this was my wrap up. Um, I would like to maybe open this maybe seven minutes for questions, uh, just uh, maybe asking uh, uh, to the participants, you arrive here as young adults to continue your studies and also to continue your artistic practices. Uh, I would like to ask you if the term of mestizaje had another meaning from uh, the position or this, this center position that you have migrating and traveling, living here in Canada, uh, how this concept of mestizaje could have changed in this, in this other North uh, and maybe if this had redefined your artistic practice. So I don't know who wants to jump in it. Sorry, uh, Nuria. Yeah, could you repeat a little bit the question? So also I can, I can open the... <laughs> I think for me, the, the question is uh, how this notion of mestizaje that we have revisiting in many different ways could have changed for you and for your artistic practice coming from the South. It's, it's something that you question uh, when you were doing your studies or when you were doing your practice in the South. And if this have changed when you come, you, you have to position yourself and position your practice here in Canada through, this, through these ideas. I mean, personally speaking, I, in that context, I prefer to, to open in some aspects the dialogue to also being able to participate in the, in the contemporary art scene through a more, uh, more like a questions about also how the, the, let's say, Canada is looking at us in the South like also not uh, taking more into the social political perspective in the aspect that also Canada has part of a, a little bit of blood on, on their hands when we talk about Latin America. And I think also we need to open those, uh, those dialogues here. Uh, when, I, when I describe the process of Suris here, it's, it's also based on that. It's also how we how we seeing uh, some sectors of our community being abused 
uh, in this context, right? And also how we're attached through assimilations, but also so disconnect in the way that the idea of creating community. So for me, the process of mestizaje is more like, or this idea of being mixed is more like try to try to seek in the environment something that helps me to connect that sometimes is mainly possible to do. And I always talk about my experience because as I said before, I lived 30, 30 years in Mexico City. So I always have on my mind more like the process of Milquia de Serrera or Maris Bustamantes in the eighties comparing with uh, artists here. But I think it's mainly open the dialogue and say like we're here and also we can contribute B despite of the Latin American art perspective that I always try to explain, we need to also analyze the differences between Latin American art and Latin American contemporary art. And also how young generations as I don't talk by myself, but for Esteban, Rodrigo and, and, and Miguel Cinta that also if they gonna be here and they want to contribute is always, is always I think a good question to add on the table. So, I mean. Yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Miguel Cinta, I don't know if you want to jump also in this because I think it's very interesting also to, to uh, think this, this concept and uh, this position uh, from this north uh, that you were uh, living and where you grown up and uh, then coming to Canada and being part also of the Canadian artistic scene. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, um, well, I, I appreciate Carlos's um, analysis there, which I think is interesting. Yeah, you know, I think, well, mestizaje, I think there's a there's a conservative rhetoric around mestizaje, which is the improvement of the race, right? El mejoramiento de la raza, right? Which is, you know, that by, you know, by like, you know, <laughs> breeding with more whiteness, right? And even are also just further white cultural exchange, you become less brown, right? Uh, that's sort of a conservative ideology that is around mestizaje. And, but, and so for me, I, I had to ask the question of like, well, what is the worsenment of the race, right? Okay, if you, what is the antithesis of that? And, you know, for me, I think, you know, mestizaje, part of why I call it a methodology is because for me, um, it's, a, it's a kind of madness, right? It's a kind of, um, it's a, it's a worldview. It just, I, I exist inside of it. And, the, and I feel like the more having now gone from one North into an, another North, it's like, you know, the little dolls that fit inside of each other. I just like, when will this end? It's like, there's all, you know, there's all these national contexts are now crammed in into me and I'm a different person in each one of them right within and I do mean specifically these nation states right with these structures which are so particular and each one has its very specific racial structure all of that um it, it makes it makes me feel crazy and and that comes out in my in my creative practice absolutely um and it makes me have to kind of uh reassess myself creatively um, and particularly, you know, as I say, okay, well, how do I make my own kind of, if, you know, if the borders are kind of arranged around me, how can I make boundaries with these nation states and say, okay, well, yeah, I don't, you know, maybe I don't want to be implicated in this way. You know, I actually would like to make alliances with the indigenous, you know, the various different indigenous cultures and nations here in this territory, right, and have that dialogue instead of, getting sucked into, you know, and it's, it is certainly not always an option, but getting sucked into these other, other structural narratives, if that makes sense. And I know I'm not being very concrete in terms of what that looks like on a material practice level, but I assure you it's there for sure. I think for me, sorry, can I also answer? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, for me as a, like, as a Brazilian, um, because like Brazil is a really specific case in Latin America because we we speak a different language uh, and a lot of people um, still think that we speak Spanish, for example. Um, and there are a lot of layers, I think, for this answer, because like um, as I move it here, I, I am not living here for that much. I, I have moved in September, so I have been living here for only eight months. Uh, roughly so my experience like at first was the first year of my PhD was online 
So I saw myself uh, as kind of like a Canadian avatar of myself, which I needed to perform and to, you know, deliver the expectations of knowledge in the Western way. Um, so I definitely had some time to adjust to these expectations and also linguistically, right? Like to be able to communicate in a way that I could be heard and could be understood. So there are really like so many layers that impact my identity. And another thing is that here in the North, I'm always racialized it and I'm all, always put it together in the Latin context, right? Like I am homogenized as a Latino. While in Brazil, we don't necessarily see ourselves even as Latinos, right? Like there are a lot of people, even in other countries of Latin America that consider Brazil as something apart. Um, because I think that especially linguistically, we kind of create this symbolic frontier uh, between Brazil and the other Latin American countries. But definitely we have a lot of convergences as we could see here in this panel. So for me, it's also understanding these convergences how we can dialogue and how I actually feel comfortable around Latinos as well. Like I feel more comfortable. I feel that somehow there is a sense of community, right? That uh, I am building, I'm in the process, process of building. Um, and I think it's in, in a lot of different aspects, like in the way that some of us um, relate with our bodies and with rhythm, right? And <laughs> with image uh, and like I don't know like I think that the, the very construction of our uh, systems and how they operate are different somehow indeed and all this uh, Mississippi process affected us uh, and it still affects us um, but for me yeah like in Brazil I am much more uh, careful when I need to position myself as a racialized person while here, I am always racialized and even like, is it fired? And sometimes even in the academic realm, I am, I, I still receive questions such as, oh, I thought that you live it in the forest. Oh, like, I, I thought that I would hear less this kind of things, but I still hear a lot of that. Like, oh yeah, you live like in the Amazon, you know, like all, all this kind of things. So it's curious, like how, to understand this identity here, I think it's it's always gonna be a, a process. It's not it's not it's nothing settled. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, Hannah, I don't know if we have uh, more time. We are over time at the moment, um, but we did have a couple questions in the Q and A. I think we can take one because this one can be answered pretty quickly um, so that we are including some of the questions. And the questions from Francisco Fernando and he asks, are there emerging mestizajes happening around you as you've settled in these lands? Is mestizaje an ongoing slash everyday process? So if everyone wants to give a quick yes or no, I'm not sure. <laughs> we can end it off on that note. Carlos, do you wanna go first? Sure. Because also I, I, I think the question uh, from Francisco, I can connect it with also Hans, that he said like, um, like this idea of the concept of settler identity in the context of North America. I mean, probably people are gonna hate me, but that's not my fight. Um, I don't feel a settler here, even despite of people try to convert me in a settler here. I explain it's not my battle because uh, I think my process as a new member of this community and um, based on the experiences that I had in Mexico, uh, my commitment is contribute here. And um, I think the settler is also an aggressive word sometimes. And I always have this, this concept from uh, the Zapatista army where there's no secession behind. And there's not this process of they and us, right? So I try to bring also that kind of process from guerrilla, guerrilla circumstances and specifically the Zapatista army in the process of the fight is for everybody. It's not just for you or it's not just for me, right? So at some point when people also add on their curriculums or the process of like, I'm a settler, 
It's like, it's fine. I, I'm not I'm fight against how people identify themselves, but I feel it's not my battle or, or feel, or feel um, like the settler in the aggressive side, right? In the colonial side. I, I think it's more like thinking in the process of how, how, how I can contribute and open also new visions based on like my position here. I, I hope it makes sense. That's, that's, my, that's my answer. Um, I guess I just want to add that. Can, can I do we still Yes, have of time? course. I was going to pass it on to you. Go ahead. <laughs> that uh, I forgot. <laughs> um, whoops. Being a what settler. Question again? Oh, being a settler. Yeah. I guess that in my work, that's um, I was confused about that idea of settler um, on city territory, land acknowledgement. So I ask like the indigenous people instead of trying to read a book or instead of asking like a, a, the so-called settlers. Uh, and for me, it's like, I was interested in, in, in listening directly from, from the people that are uh, fighting that battle, like Carlos mentioned. And, and also, I guess, in relation to the question about mestizaje here in Canada, for me, the, the concept of mestizaje has like a like a little bit like a like a violence in, in, in it. It was like a term that was imposed by the Spanish. So there's like a small degree of violence there. So also like mestizaje has been used in the 70s and 60s and 80s in South America to kind of like appropriate from the indigenous cultures in order to create like a, um, a national identity the whole Latin American boom. Uh, there was a huge painter in Ecuador. His name is Guaya Samin, and he also was uh, working with indigenous people, those themes. So I guess it's, it, in my case, I'm, I'm trying to, as I mentioned before, like I try to move away from, from an extractive gaze to, of, this means like stop seeing like indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous cultures as, as a resource. And, and, and just try to talk like one-to-one. -one. Like there's this idea from this scholar, uh, Dylan Robinson, that he says like there's a nation to nation uh, conversation instead of like a extraction from, from, a, from a powerful or more, more violent uh, settler position to, uh, that extracts from, from those indigenous ways of knowing. So yeah, I guess that's my, my only comment. Thank you, Theron. <laughs> Um, no, so, yeah, I just wanted to wrap up quickly this yes. because, I think <laughs> and I think the question is it's it's uh, it's it's very important, and and I just wanted to say that for me this idea is 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 more about how we are visualizing these power relations uh, and inequities, in fact, that exist, and how we position ourselves and how we position uh, our artistic practices or we, our critical thought in this very complex uh, uh, reality. And I would say maybe in this balance of between the community and the individual that you were saying, Carlos, uh, bringing back this idea of, of Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, no? Um, so I will leave it there. Uh, just to thank uh, everyone uh, for being here, the public, of course, but uh, the panelists, Hannah, Tamara, and uh, the incredible, uh, also, les interprètes, <laughs> los, los traductores, that uh, were with us today in this panel.